Hi, I'm Dylan Sprouse, and here's how I went from brewing mead and dirty buckets in my garage at 16 years old to being the world's youngest master brewer. I started brewing when I was 16 years old, um, and really it was because I wanted to try drinking alcohol with my friends, like most little rascals do. Uh, so I learned that you could buy the ingredients legally and just make it instead. So as an enterprising young man, I decided to do that, and I, and I started uh, experimenting with my friends. They all hated it, but we had a great time. Uh, my dad found it and he supported me, actually, uncharacteristically. He was like, hey, I found this. I don't know what it is. It smells like alcohol. It looks disgusting. Uh, you can continue doing it so long as I get to drink it and so long as you get to respect the craft that you're doing. And so I continued to respect it, and now I'm here. Anything brewed primarily with honey is called a mead. I was a very frantic young man and I had a, a lot of energy and, uh, and I was diagnosed with ADHD. So this was a way for me to be mellow and have a time frame of something to look forward to and not get distracted by. I tried every mead I could. I got a fake ID, I bought them, I tasted them, and I disliked a lot of them. Um, and I found that as I was brewing it, I went into the dorms in my first three years of college and I was with my RA who was living with me then and I would stash my uh, mead brewing fermenter in the closet while he was in the library doing his med school work. And I sold a lot of mead in college to my friends who obviously didn't have fake IDs and just wanted to drink in their dorms. The thing about brewing mead is, is that unlike beer or unlike distilling, which I definitely don't recommend doing on the home scale, uh, is it smells good when it ferments. After I graduated college, I had this uh, gap in my schedule, number one, because I had no longer had classes, and I was unsure whether or not I wanted to return back to acting. I knew that I wanted to pick up a hobby, and I was eager to learn still. And so my father called me and he said, well, if you want to do something with your time, you should lean into one of your passions. You love brewing, so you should take an internship or a job at a brewery. So I looked around and there was a distillery in the Brooklyn Navy Yard called Kings County who accepted me. And I eagerly rode my bike down there, smelled all the smells, saw all the sights, and I worked there for a short amount of time learning the business of brewing in general. I learned how important foot traffic was. I fell in love with the machinery. I fell in love with the big copper stills. I fell in love with the environment, the small brick building and the smell of the corn and the grains being sparged. It was just, it was amazing. After I had talked at length with most of them there, uh, I decided to embark on my mission and now we're here. A lot of people doubted me, uh, particularly in the home brewing game and the mead community. People were not sold on, uh, on the dry mead thing. A lot of people tried to talk me down from doing it. A lot of people attacked my flavors, which have now won gold medals. In general, it, was, it hurt because I expected having a kind of open arms community and I, I kind of didn't. The community's a lot better now, I think, than it was when I was kind of on the up and up. And I also just think generally not a lot of people took me seriously. A lot of people thought this was, um, not to be crass, but thought it was like a celebrity endorsement deal of a like shitty tequila brand. I think it's, it's a double-edged sword. I think that it's hurt as much as it's helped. I think that on the distribution level and on a lot of uh, people who are outside of the product or don't see the process or don't understand what we're doing, I think that they see this as an endorsement and they see it as an endorsement of a product that doesn't already have a developed market as much and so they're, they're kind of hesitant. And, uh, and I have to explain a lot that I'm actually brewing it. Right? I have to explain a lot that these are my recipes. I have to explain a lot to people that this is my business and I'm here every day I can be. That comes as a surprise to a lot of people. But on the other hand, the people who do know that, we make a splash with. 
Also, this is just kind of the ugly truth of modernity, but social media has a lot to do with the outreach of your business, and that has only stood to benefit me, right? In this case, especially with the meadery. And I authentically love to do so, right? I want to educate people about this product, which not a lot of people know about, and I'm passionate about doing it, and I have a great platform to do so. So that's been great, but it's a double-edged sword. I met my partners, one of which was uh, I met at NYU, Matt Kwan is our CFO, and he just is the most solid Alabama dude ever. Whether it's he needs to just put his head down and work, unasked, he just does it, or he's just ahead of the game 10 steps. And he had a set of skills that I just knew I did not contain within me. I have tried, but I am terrible at it. Matt is an excellent, excellent business manager, and I stay more so on the side of the creative outlets. We just meshed, and he tried almost every one of my college meads, and he tried the bad ones, and he tried the good ones, and uh, we got drunk on both. And so we were, f we were fast friends. We also played video games together, so that helped. He was working in finance, and he hated it. He was a suit. He was a suit in a cubicle, and I could see that he hated it. And he was doing everything on the outskirts of that to uh, find some passion for himself. And I think when the meadery opportunity came knocking, he jumped on board full steam, and he is so passionate and so awesome. So I, I really could not be doing this without him day to day. This area particularly, like even if you look out the windows, is kind of up and coming. It is developing and it's growing and this was an investment for a little bit of long term. Even though Williamsburg doesn't seem like long term, it seems kind of like it's arrived already. Um, but there's a lot of foot traffic and I chose Brooklyn and Williamsburg Greenpoint area because we're very close to the water treatment plant. So I chose New York over California because of the water quality and foot traffic. The nightlife scene and the brewing scene in California is great, it's just not the same. And when you have to drive 35 minutes to get anywhere, it kind of depletes the allure of stumbling across a meadery or a brewery in the middle of Brooklyn and just walking in. So that's why I chose it. And the first thing first is we needed to get our fermenters fabricated and we needed to hit uh, a number of eventual employees in our space because we got a grant by New York State. So we knew some certain things. We got our farm winery license, which uh, the farm winery is essentially means that we have to use all New York local honey and all New York local ingredients, which was totally right on because it allowed us to self-distribute. We jumped off of that, got, got the paperwork in place, fabricated our fermenters, and then built the walls around our fermenters uh, because these are too big to get through the doors of the William Vale, I guess. Uh, so I don't know what we're going to do one day if we ever decide to expand into another location, uh, but eventually we will, and we'll figure that out when we get there. Never, ever, ever skimp out on your ingredients, right? And we find the same thing here that your lab can look a certain way, which this is for us, but our biggest expense goes into making the best product that we can make because that's what counts. So I was actually home brewing with the same honey that I brew with here. Alan Tremblay and his family, uh, they were selling in the Union Square Farmer's Market and when I first moved out to New York, I started buying from them and I told them, one day, Alan, you'll see. I'll own a big meadery and I'll buy a lot of honey from you. And he's like, sure, kid. Uh, and then I did. So that was nice. And they're very excited. Now we're pretty much exclusive business partners for the most part. We buy a lot of honey from them. I like using honey that is by apiaries who don't cart their bees, which means that a lot of the times apiaries will put hundreds and hundreds of hives on the back of flatbed trucks. They'll smoke them out to put them to sleep. They'll bring them to orchards and they'll pollinate everything in the orchards and the bees will be very stressed. They'll take all the honey from that and they'll have major colony collapse, which is the reason that a lot of bees have been dying. 
And so I only like to support bees on local plots that don't get carded. And Allen has plots like that. At the end of the day, we could have spruced this manufacturing up. We could have bought a huge plot, but we would have had to spend less money on our ingredients, to, and it would have just taken the quality down of our mead, which is not what you want to do, especially if you're starting up. The best way to build a community is to actually just make good stuff. <laughs> Hey, what's up? I'm Bang Bang, and I'm gonna tell you how I went from tattooing in my mom's kitchen to owning the most famous tattoo shop in the world. I kind of learned tattooing in a, you know, not so formal way in that I taught myself really early, so ordered equipment and made a lot of mistakes on people. Luckily, really soon after I kind of got my tattoo kit and started tattooing friends. I met someone who was a professional tattoo artist and um, you know, he taught me everything I was doing wrong, taught me how to tattoo safely. That was about 15 years ago in, um, in Claymont, Delaware. I spent a couple of years working in Delaware, learning from my first teacher before moving to New York City, where at 19 years old, I was looking for jobs anywhere that would hire me. Um, and I went from street shop to street shop, from the West Village, East Village, and really nobody would give me a job. Um, I found out later, a lot of people that were managing those studios thought that the work in my portfolio wasn't mine, and because I was so young and I was doing a pretty good job. I feel like I dealt with doubt in my ability throughout my life. The only person that you have to answer to is the person in the mirror. And the only person you compete with is the expectations you put on yourself. I like when people doubt me. It makes me work harder. It makes my success even better. Um, so I don't pay a lot of attention to it. I always felt like if someone was busy, you know, pointing fingers talking about me, they're not focused on their goals. I met some other teachers along the way and really just established myself as um, someone who was always available. Really, whenever I had an opportunity to make something really difficult, um, I took that opportunity for my portfolio. I wanted better jobs. And so um, that kind of helped my trajectory in New York City in um, kind of always moving on up. So from working street shops from you know 6 p.m. to 5 a.m., to working in some of New York's most famous tattoo studios as the youngest person um, in the shop. So I got a lot of really great lessons early on from people who had tattooed, in some cases, as long as I had been alive. And so I kind of I really felt like I took the fast track to um, becoming a, a decent tattoo artist early on. A few years later, I opened my own studio and um, we found great artists that wanted to work together and uh, that have styles that are different than mine and personalities that are all um, different than mine, different backgrounds. And um, we've, we've built a pretty cool group. You know, obviously, I, I, going from a kid who just loved art um, without much direction to, you know, now I'm a business owner and I'm, I manage, you know, 50 some odd people. Um, couple stores, there's, there's so much of a learning curve in bridging the gap between artist and business. Inherently, artists don't want to deal with business. We want to just turn the world off and create. Um, artists only want the tools that they need to create their art. And, um, and, and it's, it's really satisfying because we have full control in that moment. But in owning a business, I've had to learn to rely and count on people who have skills that I don't have. Yes, I'm a businessman, but I have accountants who know numbers much better than I do. And I have business managers with doctorates and I have more lawyers than I can name because it requires so much foundation work. A lot of my effort is building that foundation, making sure our foundation is strong enough so that everything we do can stand on top of it and we can grow. If you build a house without a foundation, it'll crumble. I didn't expect to be here. You only realize how small your goals are when you reach them. I wanted to work 
for you know, the most famous tattoo artist in the most famous tattoo shop in New York when I first started. And I got that job when I was 22. And I thought, well, man, this can't be the top of the mountain. I'm only 22. And so I started to dream a little bigger. Well, once I reached that goal, I realized, well, wow, I'm, I'm 25. My goals now are seemingly unattainable, but that's gonna help me outwork my expectations. Hi, I'm Anthony McGill, and this is how I came from beginner band on the south side of Chicago to being the first African-American principal of the New York Philharmonic. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, and my parents really believed in the value of music education. And so my brother started playing the flute, and I wanted to be just like him. So uh, I chose the clarinet. The saxophone was a little bit too big. So um, it was the instrument I stuck with. My earliest audition was uh, for a concerto competition with my youth orchestra. And I had to memorize this piece and I, I had a memory slip and I totally forgot all of the music. And I walked off stage and the conductor came back after and he said, you know, Anthony, you didn't win, but you gave it your all. You played with passion and with expression and that's what music is all about. So from that moment on, I learned that you needed to do your best at every moment. You needed to show up and if you tried your hardest but also played with passion, I understood that that's the way that I was gonna lead my life. to this arts boarding school. And uh, my teacher there uh, told me right away, you need to remember that every day there's somebody that's born that is better than you at the clarinet. Don't be satisfied and think that you're already here at a really high level, because there's so much room to grow. And so what that taught me was that, you know, I, first of all, it taught me to be humble. It taught me to actually always know that I had room to improve. And what you're doing is combining your skill with a little bit of luck and hard work uh, to, to accomplish your goals. And I think he was really correct in telling me that. One of my big goals was to uh, join the New York Philharmonic as principal clarinet. And so when this job came open, I wrote um, an extensive sheet of how I was going to do this. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't get it, you know, but I had it clearly mapped out. So now, about 11 years later, and I've been with the orchestra for five years, um, I look at that sheet of paper, and it took like six years from the time it was announced for me to, to get the job. I think um, that was super valuable to have it written down somewhere. And it's like, I can't even remember having done that, but I didn't give up on the goal, and the goal didn't give up on me. A few years before the inauguration of President Obama, I got a chance to play with Yo-Yo Ma and some other people in Japan on the tour. Now, a few years later, I get a call from Yo-Yo's manager that he wants to invite me to play alongside him, Gabriela Montero, Itzhak Perlman, and play a piece written by John Williams. So obviously this was probably the craziest call I've ever gotten in my life. And the biggest lesson I learned from that was that it doesn't matter what the concert is, who it's for, who it's with, but you have to give it your all. You have to play like it's your last note and you have to show up for it because you never know when that moment, that single note, that experience is gonna change your life. One thing when you're in an environment where you feel like you're one of the few and all of my colleagues of color also understand this is that you have to, you have to stay focused. You can't let the negativity, the detractors, keep you from actually focusing on your work and being um, proud of what you've done to get to where you are. So that's what I would tell the, um, someone coming up trying to do this in a field that does not look like them. Keep striving, keep focused, and never let anyone tell you you can't do it. What up, though? I'm Rick. And I'm Ro. Here's how we went from working in a car center to being the freshest sneaker boutique on the planet. 
how I got into sneakers, this started a long, long time ago. Um, at the time, I was like, how could anybody spend $200 on a shoe? That's how broke I was. So at this point, I started making a little bit more money. It actually started with Rick. We would, we would drive to New York, go shopping, like on a Friday night, get there in the morning. So I, what I would do is I would buy like two pairs of bait for like from 200 a piece. I would sell the one of the pair for like 400. And then that's how I got into the business of like, man, these, like these, these are these things that appreciate. My first experience with sneakers was probably when I was a, when I was still in Milwaukee and my mother bought me a pair of the uh, on sale infrared Jordan 6s. And I just remember the feeling that I got when I had those shoes when I went to basketball practice. It was like, I really felt that I could play better than I did when I didn't have the shoe. As I got older and I, I continued to, to rock with sneakers and just express myself through sneakers, I think that I, I, I just grew this taste and I, I, I've really started to appreciate the details, especially since I started designing sneakers and working in the industry. Sneakers have just become probably one of my best ways of telling stories. You know, this is kind of what people know me for now. The Burn Rubber was a store. It was here, it was here before us. Burn Rubber started in 2004, and Rick uh, worked, he started off as an intern, I believe, uh, and then he, he started working at the store, and he would do, like, the things that they weren't even thinking of. Like, they weren't thinking of a website. I took it upon myself to make the current owner of Burn Rubber, my mentor. And I was like, you guys aren't on the, the internet anywhere. So I said, well, let me make a website for you. And I built this website, which I never knew how to build a, web, build a website. I went and bought um, like web HTML for dummies. Like now you could, you could put a website together because everybody's already coded it for you. At that time, I actually had to go in and figure out code. And now when I think about it, that humble spirit is what got us here. They, they, didn't, they didn't broadcast, they were selling the business to the world. They only told the people that, are, that were in the store. And uh, so Rick, because of those conversations that we, were, that we had about business and about, like I had a business plan for a store, uh, it was gonna be called uh, Sneaker Heaven. When that presented itself, he was like, yo, you have the business plan, let's kind of come together and try to make this happen. I was in the place where I just wanted to learn. I knew I had just finished school. I never had any internships. So I was like, yo, let me see if this is what I want to do. We got lawyers, we got accountants, we did our research, we bought the business. But it came because of a, a humble spirit. I remember the first thing I did, I went to a, to a bank and was like, I need blah, 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 money, amount, amounts of money. And they basically was like, all right, fam, I'm gonna head out. I, I, mean, I didn't own anything. And of course, I, at the time, it, it was just felt like crushing, but it was like, no, bro. Like, why would I give you $100,000? I'm never gonna get it back, right? So then we started talking to our, our relatives, you know, how did Ghost and Tommy come up with a million, two million dollars, I'm sorry. Um, and then we start, I started talking to my grandmother on my, on my father's side, and they were like, then they started talking. And they were like, yo, we're gonna figure out how we're gonna come up with this. So I don't, I honestly don't know exactly how much money my mother put in and how much money my grandmother put in. And then it was the same thing with, with Rick. It was crazy, it, you know what I'm saying? But that's how, that's how this stuff works. Like when, when, you, when you believe in, your, in what you're manifesting, you get what I'm saying? Uh, and that's what it was. And, and it, it literally, in a matter of a month and a half at most, we started talking in December about getting the store, early to mid-December, and we signed the, the paper for the lease and everything on Valentine's Day. Like, we left our wives to go sign this paper. You know, it's crazy. I tell people all the time that my first business was my self-funded internship. I, took, I put the time in. I took the time to analyze the business, take L's, lose hundreds of thousands of dollars, make hundreds of thousands of dollars. But all of that time that we put in is why Ro and I are able to do what we do today. My man, Jay John, who's still the manager here to this day, he, uh, he was, in, a, in, a, he was a, in high school at the time. And he was in a crew, they were throwing parties and everything, and then and Big Sean was in that crew. 
So they would come to the store and just kind of chill, you know, and then we would just, we would go to like little sneaker events and him and Sean would be there or whatever. And then Sean just started coming through and then it was just like, oh man, I'm about to get signed to like Kanye. And it's like, then it got to the point where he's going around to these places and then he sees Wale and Wale like, yo, what's up with that? That's fresh. And then it's like, yo, my man, when you, when you come to Detroit, you got to go through Burn Rubber. And then now we're in Chicago and we're in DC doing these things. And when they come here, it's just, it's just all love. Making connections, treating people like family. Business is dealt on relationships. <laughs> so, uh, Rick and I were, at this point, this was like, maybe like 2010-ish. So we start talking, it's like, yo, we gonna, we gonna do it, man. We gotta, you know, we gonna call, what we gonna call it? We gonna call it like a Folex. And it's like, we call it a, we could call it a Brolex. A burn rubber Olex. Genius. I'm like, a Brolex, bro? I want it to be something real that we can build. But I'm like, yo, that could be fun. Let's, all right, let's do it, bro. It's, let's go, Brolex. I'm gonna make a big B, a big R, and I'm gonna make the Olex small so it's clear that it says BR Olex. Bape it did Bape X, so we were like, yo, we won't get in trouble. That was the dumbest thing we've ever said. We went nuts with this. We, we uh, it made all these different blogs. So then, like, two weeks later, the mail comes in. So it comes to me, the mail, I open it and read this letter. And my stomach drops, okay? Ro gets this letter, he reads the letter, doesn't say anything to anyone hands me the letter and walks out. So I look at the letter, I'm like, what? They won. I'm sorry, so I, I just start asking everyone, how much does a Rolex cost? We ended up uh, calling the attorney. I called Mike and I'm like, Mike, listen, we are in a situation and we need you to help us out. Like, you guys have nothing to worry about. And you guys just pay me a million dollars an hour. <laughs> but he got us out of it. We didn't have to pay, and we learned our lesson, and we destroyed everything. The, the first Yeezy came out, with the Nike Yeezy came out, and um, we, get to store, we get to the store on a Friday morning, or like a Thursday morning, and it's a dude sitting at our store. And I'm like, hey, what, you, what are you doing here? You know what I'm saying? It's not, a shoe doesn't come out this week. He was like, I'm, I did, I'm getting, I'm waiting on the Yeezy. And I'm like, bro, it comes out next Saturday. I don't, I can't remember who said it, but one of us was like, man, let's go tell them it's gonna, they cost a thousand dollars. That'd get them out of here. Man, Rick go outside and say, uh, yo, I just wanna let y'all know, the price of the Yeezys are gonna be $1,000 plus tax, right? Everybody in line did this. Man, man, you playing. I'm straight. Che everybody checked their accounts and was like, I'm good. And it was like, so we selling them for $1,000 a piece? And then the, the rest is history, like by the, by the that Friday or Saturday, it came out Saturday, so by that Friday, CNN had came by, MSNBC, we were on MSNBC, the radio, every local radio station, it was like the headline was like, local sneaker store marks up shoe 400%. Is it, and these kids are still waiting in line, is it worth it, is it blah, blah, blah. It was just crazy, but that got us a lot of attention to the, to literally to the world. We are the ones that came together and we're doing things on, on, on the grassroots level that, that kind of changed the, the landscape of, 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 the, of the sneaker game. And now, you know, it, it's where it is now. You have, you know, StockX and the GOAT and everyone's able to make money off of sneakers, which is a beautiful thing. I'm Claudia Ashray, and this is how I went from girl with no job to girl with like 75 jobs. Freshman year, I got an internship in fashion, which I know I look very stylish. It was unpaid. It was such long hours, so many 
remedial tasks to do. So I started a blog called Girl With A Job where I just basically diaried about life as an intern, wrote down all the mean things people said to me. I eventually got fired from that internship since I just wasn't very good at it and it would have fired me too. So I changed the name of the blog from Girl With A Job to Girl With No Job just for accuracy purposes because that name really attracted people, especially people from my generation and found like a really unique community on Instagram that blew up my business and then I started going on tour, I started two podcasts, I became a DJ briefly, which we don't need to talk about, and here I am now. Starting my own company was actually very confusing because they don't teach you how to file a 1099 in college and they don't teach you that in high school either. So it was a huge learning curve for me because I was doing it all by myself. I didn't have like a partner or an investor. It was just me literally Googling like how to file taxes. And I've only recently gotten my shit together when it comes to the organization of an actual business. Probably the hardest part about starting my own business was the trademarking. I shockingly had never trademarked anything before. And I think I used like a 1-800 number lawyer firm that was super sketchy, but they got the job done. And to this day, like they still own my trademark and they did a great job. So don't write off an 800 number. I think the hardest part and what people don't think about when they wanna set out and start their own business is really like the back end logistics of what it means to be a business owner. And I learned that a very hard way and I made a lot of mistakes and it cost me a lot of money. So if you're watching this video and you wanna start a business, like go for it, but just like don't forget about the boring stuff like accounting. So the core of my business and how I got started was on Instagram and I started getting a lot of followers and started working with brands and like really turning it into a business that by the time I graduated college, it was enough of a revenue earner that I didn't need to get a full-time job and that was really scary and I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this full-time. I started my first podcast called Girl With A Podcast when podcasting was starting to like be introduced as a, this interesting medium for people in the digital space. and. It was good, it wasn't some of my finest work and it wasn't the best audio quality, but I just wanted to get started and people really seemed to enjoy it and I started to work on it and change it and then I got the opportunity to do a morning show podcast, which I thought would be way better than Girl With A Podcast and I host that with my sister, The Morning Toast and then we started to create this like really awesome community of like young, mostly female, millennials, like people who love pop culture, people who just like wanna connect with people who are similar to them and I had this burgeoning audience and I'm like, okay, what can I do next? We have the podcast. Uh, I wanna on tour and I've always wanted to do comedy and now that I had the initial audience to get me there I was so much more comfortable than doing it just for no reason and now we've been on tour for 18 months and it's so much fun. A huge part of working in the digital space is being able to predict you know changes and trends in apps like when all those kids on Vine were basically put out of business when Instagram launched 30 second videos, like that changed the landscape of digital forever. And I know it sounds dramatic, but it's true. So kind of, I always talk to my sister, she's three years younger than me, um, but she is really of a different generation. I kind of stand between millennial and Gen Z and she is very much a Gen Z. So I'll talk to her and be like, what are your friends doing this weekend? Like, do they use Snapchat? Like, what are they like? And it's annoying for her, but it's actually really helpful for me to see like where trends are moving and always embracing it. Like. When I was obsessed with Snapchat and when Instagram uh, released their stories, at first I was really reluctant and I think that was a very bad attitude to have. And I almost wish I'd gotten on even sooner than I did because I was so loyal to Snapchat. You have to embrace the changes. If you're the type of person who's sitting there being like, this is never gonna work, this is never gonna happen, like you're gonna get left behind. So embrace it and just have fun with it. We had been doing the podcast for about a year before I felt comfortable enough to take my comedy on tour. And I think having the backbone and the structure of the podcast audience being so strong is really what helped me feel confident to do it. And I said, okay, I'm gonna do it once. I booked a show at Caroline's on Broadway in New York. And I'm like, I'm gonna do two shows and we'll take it from there. If nobody comes by, if everyone loves it, great, we'll do more, crazy. I remember being on a plane, like having hyperventilating, like the plane was gonna take off and I wasn't gonna be able to see if the tickets were selling. I'm on the phone with my manager, I'm like, no one's gonna buy any tickets. And the tickets sold and once the, I was over that hurdle, I was like, oh my God, now I have to write a show and be funny. And that was probably even more of a pit in my stomach than actually selling the show. I ended up doing six shows at Caroline's because there was so much demand. And once I had those under my belt, I felt like really I could do anything. And I started looking into my Instagram analytics and being like, okay, where are cities where we have the most followers on the podcast, where I have the most followers on Instagram? So then I went to Chicago and I went to Boston and I 
for the last year and a half been really leaning into my Instagram analytics to lead me where I should go. And then also spending so much time, I worked with a comedy coach, so much time perfecting my show because you're only gonna get people in the door once. And if your show stings, they're never coming back. But if they love it, they're gonna bring someone who maybe doesn't follow you on Instagram and that's how your audience can double overnight. So I am so hard on myself about putting together a show that I'm really proud of. And it's at a place where I feel like it's awesome. When you work in this industry, it can be really easy to be so hard on yourself because so many strangers on the internet are so quick to be so hard on you. Um, and I'm definitely the type of person who is extremely hard on myself, but also knows where the line is. Like I'm hard on myself to a point where I'm like, you know what? Forget it, like it was great. I'll get off stage and wanna cry because I'm like, that was the worst show. And my sister who manages my tour is like, you're crazy, that was your best show yet. So. I think it's really important to have people around you who you really trust and they can be honest with you when they can be like, you know, that show wasn't that great. Or they can be, be truthful and be like, no, it was great. I just wanna keep growing my numbers, keep growing the podcast, keep going on tour, keep you know being a positive light in people's life. Like everything that I do is very much happy, positive. There's so much tragedy in the world and there's so much negativity. So everything I do online tries to negate that so I can go to bed being like, you know, I think I made one person happy today. And honestly, that's good enough for me. Hi friends, I'm Amita Kasem and I'm the founder of Flower Shop. Hey, I'm Ross Harrow and I'm CEO of Flower Shop. I think before I was a baker, I was just a baby <laughs> because I actually grew up baking. It wasn't anything I ever thought would be my career or my job. So when I went to school in Los Angeles and was working in the fashion industry there, I was baking for you know colleagues' birthdays, people would come in asking, you know, where did you buy this cake? That's when I realized maybe that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. Taking a leap was definitely a huge risk. You know, you go from a steady paycheck to then realizing that you're just going to have to hope an order comes in in order to make that paycheck. And I think that that was really the biggest risk for me is going from something steady to something that you're just winging it and believing in yourself. And you definitely do hit a moment where you realize, you know, I'm putting more effort into my side hustle than I am my real job. And there's a moment where you feel like I believe in myself enough now that I think this can work. And I was able to leave my steady job to start what is now my really steady job. <laughs> Before I worked at Flower Shop, I was in experiential marketing. So I did strategy for large tech brands when they had a new product release or they had a software update. In the transition to being a founder and going from a company that had hundreds of people to a company that was myself and my wife Amira was very different, mostly because we were working out of our own apartment at first. There's not this big machine or big institution driving things forward. There's not that inertia there. You really have to make sure that you are doing the work, that you are covering everything that needs to be covered and that you have the drive that needs to be there in order to get your organization up and running. Because I see the vision of what I want Flower Shop to be and I, I know what it should become in my mind and getting there, there's so many different steps, there's so many different hires that we need to make, but it is hard for me to sort of step back and say, okay, I would love to do this to enhance our creative, but really we need to do this to enhance our kitchen we didn't hire a dishwasher. I had no idea that the bakers weren't going to wash their own dishes. I was like, oh, that makes sense. You bake something and then you wash your own pan, but that's not how it works because the bakers are really good at baking and it's not worth their time to then go wash that pan. Then once I started interviewing bakers, it was very, very interesting because they were all coming from different bakeries and you know, a lot of them came in asking me, where's my mix? And I'm just thinking to myself, what do you mean? This is a bakery. Here's my flour, sugar, like I don't understand. And what I learned is that most bakeries actually are baking starting with a mix. And so I think that that's something that's been able to keep us very authentic is that we do everything from scratch. It also really taught me that believing in the way that you do things as a small business isn't necessarily wrong. It can be something that is the way you were taught and that makes you more authentic. Maybe I am more skilled of a baker than I, than I thought I was because I was able to do so many different things because I didn't go to culinary school and I wasn't trained in a classical way that I'm able to think outside the cake box. <laughs> 
Hi, I'm Lewis Miller. I started out working at a private golf club in Seattle pulling weeds and planting geraniums, and now I own my own business in Manhattan and I'm creator of the Flower Flash. I grew up in gardens and I grew up with flowers and the idea of bringing all this stuff inside really appealed to me. From the youngest, you know, seven or eight years old, I was always addicted to House and Garden magazine and House Beautiful and, and the way that rooms were styled and the way that flowers brought a room to life was so appealing and growing up in Central California, all I had to do was go outside cut armloads of things and I could experiment and have that same effect. I found it extremely gratifying how quick it, you could make a change and then how, because of the nature of flowers, you could just turn around and do it over and have a completely different results. My first job in college was working at a private golf club in Seattle and it was a summer job and literally it was pulling weeds. Somehow I became friends with one of the members there and she was in her 70s and she was like the only female member on this you know, private club of 400 guys. Um, and we became buddies and I really parlayed that job as a summer laborer to being like, sure, I can, you know, I can do flowers. I'd love to do it. I'm like, here's what we can do. Here's what we can do. I started doing all their Christmas decorations. I do it. I did their weekly flowers. Then I started doing their private parties, and I had this sweet little system where I was like, working for the club, but then doing all their stuff on the side. Got to test out every crazy idea on them. Had some really triumphant moments and some big disasters, but you know, next week did it all over again. So it was a really great learning experience for me. And I'm naturally a go-getter, so I was just fearless and I went after it and it just kind of parlayed into me doing my own thing. So when I actually made the leap from Seattle um, to New York, it was in 2000, I was 25. When I moved here, I had two suitcases and so I didn't have financial obligations. I didn't have a great, I wasn't moving to New York to you know, like to be discovered or be to party or live a life or, or, or kind of like chase this dream. I was here to work. So my satisfaction and my energy was all put towards working. To be perfectly honest, the idea of failing never really crossed my mind. And I don't say that in like a cocky or cavalier way, but it's not, failure is not one of my fears um, because I know that with enough thought and enough preparation and the right team, you know, you can really do anything you put your mind to. So um, I think if I fear anything, it's probably boredom more than failure. It's scary, but if you overthink it, you'll never do anything. I mean, honestly, if I had known how this road was gonna be, I would have stayed paralyzed on my sofa in Seattle and have never moved, but I would have never changed it. Of course, if it's been, you know, scary and real and amazing things have happened and some pretty crappy things have happened, but I mean, isn't that gonna happen no matter what you do? So you might as well be pursuing something you love. So after um, being in this business for, you know, 17, 18 years, you know, I wanted to do something that had a little bit more edge to it that was giving back in a way that wasn't just the typical, like just writing a check, but something that somebody was a little bit more tangible. I would always be reminded on the Friday afternoon if we took an armload of flowers and took them home on the subway, how people would stop and really like look at them. And being able to work with this kind of beauty all day long, you forget how special it is. That's where the idea of the flower flash came in and that was really to create these sort of unorthodox pop-up, floral installations that kind of had no purpose other than to just be there, be beautiful, and just sort of disappear. And we started those about two and a half years ago, and it's been an incredible adventure. And one of my clients called me up and she's like, this was the most brilliant PR thing you could have ever done, which is true, but it's funny because that was the last thing on my mind. And I had no idea it would actually turn out that way. I just knew that I creatively, it was a combination of like, of being satisfied with my job and the situation and our projects, but honestly, you know, being a little bored. And like I said, boredom doesn't set well with me. And so <clears throat> this need to give back, but also push myself creatively 
into something and do something that I hadn't necessarily seen before and you know willing to work and try and and make it work and so when when I when I have the success of getting new clients or finishing up a job it feels really good and it motivates me to like hmm you know I guess I'll keep this job <laughs> I'll st stick stick with it for a while Hi, I'm Jake Schwartz, and here's how I went from going lost and lonely in the world of work in my early 20s to starting and building a global education company. I don't think I knew exactly what I wanted to do um, when I went to college, or even when I really when I left college, and it was pretty scary. I, I was very stressed out. I, I, I talk a lot about that period feeling very lost and really lonely. I got to business school and I looked around and said, why is this taking two years? Um, why does this have to cost this much money? And I kind of thought that there might be a way to, to sort of shorten that path, sort of disrupt the middleman. In a lot of ways, that was a big, big part of the inspiration for what eventually became General Assembly. In many ways, we did everything you weren't supposed to do, right? I mean, first off, this was a project I don't think any of us thought was going to be an ongoing 10-year venture-backed startup that would end up getting sold to a multinational corporation. That was, this was a, a project that just made sense on the ground and we thought people needed it. These opportunities appear and you gotta sorta know when they're appearing where you kinda just, for whatever reason, whether you're in the right place at the right time or you identified like a real need or something like that, that's where the magic is. You know, I would say another big point for us was when we decided to raise venture capital. It was a big decision and, and we were really split on whether or not we should raise venture capital. You're like a train going down the track at that point and it's very hard to get off that track. And all the time that I meet with young entrepreneurs who are like, well, I'm gonna raise this round, but I may not raise another round. And there are so few entrepreneurs who are able to do that once you do that, because now the money is real, you have a, a, an investor at the table, you start to lose control of the story you wanna tell. And that's okay, because in some ways, um, it's the collaboration and that tension that creates really great outcomes. But it was something that we were, I think, very thoughtful about. And I think I encourage everyone else to be that thoughtful about because it's, it doesn't come without a cost. One of my favorite stories was one of the times I, I remember coming in the morning and saying, how did the class go last night? And I said, well, it was fine. But then they all went home early because the projector stopped working. And I said, wait, we can't just have people going home because like, nobody could figure out how to work a projector. And so that was the origination of a model where we said, why don't we staff each class with an individual? And let's make sure that the instructor has everything they need, the students have everything they need. And that became a core part of our, our model here at GA. Um, and it allowed us to ensure that everyone who comes to our courses has a good experience. We didn't know what we were doing, but we sort of thought from first principles. And that's what I would really give as advice is, Think about it not from, oh, what does the industry do or what are best practices, but what makes sense. The real task of building like a company that lasts um, and sustains itself is a lot about things like who do you hire? How do you hire? How do you build your team? How do you run that team? What metrics are you gonna track with that team to make sure everything's going well? when you're so big that you can't actually go across the table and say, hey, how are things going? Um, a lot of it is taking that original thing that was working and just continuing to build on it. But what we have to do is now figure out how to do that with 500 people all around the world, right? With different ideas of what success looks like and what GA is and what we're doing for customers and trying to make that as successful as it can be. It really becomes the art in building the right systems and building um, an or a true organization that can actually handle complexity and solve problems in real time. Hey guys, I'm Danielle Bernstein and I'm the founder of We Were What.
We were what started actually as a street style blog. I was photographing street style around FIT's campus when I was attending school there and eventually turned the camera on on myself and we were what became a personal style blog. But now I definitely consider myself an entrepreneur because not only am I an influencer, but I'm also a designer, a tech entrepreneur, an advisor, an investor, and a handful of other things. I think I've sort of branded myself as this, you know, native New Yorker, this young entrepreneur, 20 something, just trying to make it in the city like everyone else. And so being this perfect mix of relatable and aspirational is something that I focused on and I think has helped with the longevity of my career. The best piece of advice I would give to someone who wants to do what I do is to find a niche and a space in the market that doesn't exist because it is a very oversaturated industry and it's hard to stand out, so you have to be different. I've pretty much grown up with my followers. I've grown up on my Instagram and in the public eye as far as my style developing, uh, my personal growth, and I've shared that with my readers along the way. A big moment for me was surpassing a million followers. It was sort of a milestone and a point that I wanted to reach. I, I think it happened overnight, actually. So I guess I woke up to a million followers, which was an awesome moment. And two million followers happened on New Year's this year. So they were both really cool moments and great celebratory opportunities. And my friends actually threw me a surprise party, which was awesome. So I deal with criticism in a number of ways. I definitely think haters mean you're doing something right, but it can get emotional and it gets hard to see the hateful comments. And then on the other hand, I ask my followers, what can I be doing better? What can I be doing differently? And I take that as constructive criticism and my followers power my business. So I really take what they say seriously. The uncertainty of a social media career definitely was something that I think motivated me to keep going and to every day get up, make it as nine to five as possible, have a content calendar. I have a team that I work with. So even if I'm working from home, I got up every day and got dressed like I was going to the office. And I think it definitely helped to sort of validate and, and make it more official. If you're trying to spearhead your own way into a new industry, I would say be a disruptor you have to disrupt the industry. I mean, influencers disrupted the fashion industry and created a whole new sector of it. So definitely look for a way to change it in a positive way. What's up guys, I'm Wisby, and today I'm here to tell you where my story started and where I am today. I always kind of felt that I'd be doing something to my own calling. Never really took myself as like an in the box, kind of in a cubicle. Not that there's anything wrong with that either. Everybody kind of has their own, their own calling. Um, but for me, that was never something I gravitated towards. As an artist and a creative, I find some kind of responsibility to articulate those things that people can't and to possibly convey messages uh, that can make a change. For my art, um, I do acrylic on canvas painting. I do a lot of silk screening black and white photography, neons, casting, mold making. I and mean, if it's something that I haven't done, that's probably on my list of things to do. To be able to work for myself is great because uh, I'm allowed the freedoms to kind of navigate through this world how I deem the most efficient. It's a love-hate relationship, that's for sure. One of the biggest learning curves was what is a productive, successful day and what is an unproductive, successful day? And honestly, personal mental health days are productive, successful days. I've never liked the term procrastination because I was also one of those kids that was deemed to have like ADHD and all these things. Procrastination like culturally seems to be basically defined as if you leave something to the last minute or not. I binge work, I work very last minute, I work up until the last minute. Um, am I going to do something before it needs to get done? Not necessarily. Who's gonna call me out on procrastinating? I am my own boss and I do work for myself, so as long as I get done what needs to get done, did I execute what I need to execute is really what I focus on. The thing about procrastination, if you wanna use it towards your advantage, is it's like, look inside internally how you structure time, how you work most efficiently, what you need to do to get things done. Um, and then how you define that is totally up to you as well. The biggest thing for me that's held me back is myself and fear, whether it's pertaining to 
my creative career now or just as an adolescent and like getting through school. I'm a college dropout. You know, I didn't graduate and I didn't follow traditional form, but this is what I do. I create, I literally create the path moving forward. So sometimes if I get a little bit wrapped up in myself, what I'll get caught up on is uh, future tripping. I get worried about like, am I gonna run out of ideas? Are people not gonna like me anymore? What's gonna happen if this doesn't work? So many things that I've worried about in the past, so many people, places, and things, and ideas, and fears, and aren't here today. You know, anything that I was worried about, or whatever it may have been, never carried through and survived that whole journey. The biggest thing that I could say is, is just don't be discouraged and don't listen to the outside noise. Asking for help is a big piece of advice. It doesn't mean that you're weak. It doesn't mean that uh, you're not capable of, but like, I don't know everything. I didn't know that I could sell my artwork in a gallery. I didn't know what selling artwork meant. I didn't know that I could support myself from it. I didn't know the ceilings on it. I didn't know the relationships that I could have with people and the reach that I could potentially have. That's kind of really surprised me. And at this point, I think I could safely say it's, there is a global reach.